Frequency Freaks, I am Commander Claymore Fury, and this is Urgent Frequency for the week of Sunday, well, guys, September uh, 23rd, 2012. To, uh, well, here we match, are, episode uh, 99, uh, as the countdown to our 100th episode reaches a full boil, and all I know is that we have some big things planned to you guys celebrate. Haven't been following Speaking of the big, they say that everything's bigger of, in Texas. A lot of issues now, I don't know anything with, about that, uh, but if this week's Starhawk update and DLC and, from uh, White Box Interactive is any indication, yet, they might just be right. So, um, Starhawk senior designer I'm Andrew so Welton joins me to sort through a mammoth right mountain of colossal content. It's the only podcast fun. to never win you a know, game we, by we throwing an interception. Box. This so is Urgent Frequency. Get you guys some cool prizes and things like that. And then for a couple of clans to just hey guys, stop all over. Hey guys, here from PlayStation Network Core and Fearnet.com. Hi, this is Raider from the Sea Sniper. Hey, this is one from the PlayStation Nation podcast. This is Anadab. Hey, this is Eduardo Vasconcelos. You are listening to Urgent Frequency. Urgent Frequency. Urgent Frequency. Urgent Frequency. Urgent Frequency. Urgent Frequency. Only on. Only on. Only on. Confirming that they've already talked to the other clan. Which, you know, similar to what Game Battle is. I am Commander Claymore Fury for UrgentFury.com. The brave men and women. Collision. and our nation's armed forces made a commitment uh, to protect us and our freedom. Basically Many will come home with missing yeah, limbs, that is not severe exactly. burns, or traumatic so, brain injuries. Um, the Wounded we're Warrior do Project tonight, was created to help and support these Warhawk injured Society heroes through and programs and, and services play, that help make and, their recoveries and, uh, that much easier. Regardless of your position Wednesday on the night, war, our wounded veterans deserve our support. Thursday night, to learn Thursday more, night, call uh, 1-877-TEAM-WWP. That's one 877 832-6997 or visit WoundedWarriorProject.org Hoo-yah! The other two clans are going to be pulled out. So, I apologize for that to uh, those of you guys that are trying to be legit. But, uh, I... All I can tell you is your clans do not want to... This is Harvard Bond. Play with uh, Order an operator at a Bonn Steakhouse. And, uh, that's what we're gonna have Are you to tired do. of all these Integrity other steakhouses the promising fast service, Fury. only to make you wait Playing up for 45 minutes cheating. for your meal? Simple as that. So, well, I'm here to tell you that at Bonn's, we, we think will, that's uh, just unacceptable. Up the matches here shortly. We're waiting on the you know, uh, unit versus in the old West, society server. A man's start. word was his bond, and that means something here at Bonn's. So here's my promise to you. You'll get your meal when it's damn good and ready. Look, folks, we're not just cooking your steak. We're cooking everybody's steak. I mean, that's a lot of steak. And while we'd like to drop everything just to accommodate your busy schedule, well, that's just ridiculous. We know you want your meal now, but trust me, good things come to those who wait. I'm Harvard Bonham, and I promise you'll get it when it's damn good and ready. Bonin Steakhouse, exit 27A off I-75, north of Richmond. There are times when you have so much to say, just so little time. Uh, excuse me, what? Good thing there's Twitter. We got you covered with the latest and the most talked about topics. 140 characters at a time. Follow us on Twitter. Commander Sportos, motorheads, geeks, sluts, bloods, wastoids, dweebies, dickheads, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude.
Before Starhawk launched back in May of this year, Urgent Fury had already been working behind the scenes to develop a relationship with the studio responsible for the game. And since the game's release, I'm happy to say that due in large part to a very loyal fan base, a successful tournament event hosted by Urgent Fury, and a developer who works in concert with the aforementioned fan base, Lightbox Interactive Starhawk continues to garner industry buzz months after its initial release. Recently, LBI announced that Starhawk fans will be rewarded for their unwavering allegiance to the franchise with a massive update and some very special downloadable content that will include, among other things, five new multiplayer maps, three new game modes, brand new build and battle loadouts, and a multitude of other various goodies. To shed some light on all of that and to make sense of it, Lightbox Interactive President Dylan Job has sent us the man who led the team responsible for most of what you'll see in this update. I'm very happy to welcome to Urgent Frequency Senior Game Designer at at Lightbox Interactive and lead designer on the Starhawk 1.04 update and brand new DLC, Andrew Weldon. What's going on, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. Um, you know, we just we're now now we've got the patch out today to everybody, so I've been just kind of watching what people are doing with it and what they're saying online, and so far so good, I think. So yeah, I've heard nothing but good so far, and uh, everybody seems to like the uh, the launcher, which we'll we'll get into that here in just a second. Don't want to spoil any surprises. Was it a touchdown or was it an interception? We might as well go ahead and talk about it since everybody. Ah <laughs> uh, man, I I I'm not even going to comment on that. That's, uh, they they need to fix that quick. Yeah, they need to get that straightened out. It would, the good news is, though, if things ever go south and, God forbid, anything goes wrong at, at Lightbox, you, you've you got a future as a potential referee in the NFL. Uh, I think a lot of people do. <laughs> so. uh, before we get into all this, uh, Harvard Bonin, you know, he was a guest here on the podcast a few episodes back, and uh, what a what a personality. It must be great to be able to go to work and hang out with a guy like uh, Harvard. But uh, So I, I think I have a pretty firm grasp on Harvard uh, with regard to his personality. But before we begin, I, I, I got to know this. And I've seen tons of interviews with Dylan Job, and I've read a lot of stuff about him. I, I just, I, I admire the guy for the most part. But is he really as thoughtful, mild-mannered, and creative as he seems? Or is he, and you can be honest... Is he in reality a cold-hearted slave driver? Send help now. <laughs> no, um, no, he's been uh, he's been great to work for. I mean, it's uh, just the the team in general here has been great to work with as well. And I think um, one of the things that that served us really well is that that kind of open communication that Dylan has. You know, I mean, he he is swamped like you wouldn't believe on a daily basis, and still, you know, especially every day going through the DLC stuff, um, working as the the design lead there. I was in his ear every day, knocking on the door, making him take his headphones off, put them back on when I'm done. I'm back five minutes later, probably annoying the hell out of him, but uh, you know, always always making the time to you know to figure out what needs to be figured out. Um, I, I think that kind of carried over to the, the the fan base as well. You know, very open on Twitter. Um, you know he's super busy, so maybe not always. You may not always get an immediate response, but you know always paying attention to that and uh, making sure that we're we're paying attention to what the what the Starhawk players are saying and and feeling, and uh, you know just keeping it open too. I mean, you know we had the beta and you know had all the the feedback coming through there and. Also, you know, I can't count the number of times that we've had fans just come into the studio. You know, they'll, they'll send Dylan a message on, on Twitter and say, hey, I'm in Austin today. And, uh, you know, you see him then walking through the office with a bunch of strangers and, you know, giving introductions and showing a little, you know, when we were still working on the game, even showing some behind the scenes what, what we were working on. And, you know, I, I think that's something that, that served us really well during Starhawk's development. It's really a testament. I mean, in, in, in an industry, and I look, I'm, I, I'm not pretending like I know anything, but in an industry that seems like that's a new concept, really, uh, it, it's a testament for you guys because I, I, I really do think that is it, it's directly related to why your fan base is so rad and why they're so passionate. It must just be a great atmosphere uh, working at Lightbox. So uh, I, I'm glad to hear that he's uh, actually a really cool guy to be around. And he does. Uh, I, I've noticed on Twitter he... he he really tries to reach out uh, in a way. Uh, I interviewed uh, David Sears uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of a few weeks back, but we were talking about how a lot of developers use the the term.
term community as a buzzword and things like that. But it's really good to see a developer that is uh, that thinks that the uh, community is more than a buzzword. So uh, kudos to you guys on that. Uh, before we get into the actual specifics of the uh, update and the DLC and everything else, uh, for those who uh, don't know, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Give us Just give us a brief industry bio if you can. Tell us how you... I uh, ended up uh, as one of the lead designers on this project. Well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I've been working professionally now for uh, just over eight years. Uh, I got my start back in 2004. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of in that era, I got my start the way a lot of us did in the, the mod community, uh, making stuff in our spare time. And, um, you know, so I, I was out of the Half-Life mod community. Uh, around that area, you've got people coming out of, you know, Quake, Quake 2, Half-Life, uh, Unreal, um, Quake 3 was a big one, um, and so, you know, I just, I got my start just kind of making Half-Life deathmatch maps in my spare time, and uh, over time got more involved in the mod community, I led a big single-player project for a while with a bunch of friends, and uh, the big thing was I got involved with the Natural Collection mod team, which was a really, really great multiplayer mod uh, back in the day. Uh, Space Marine versus Alien, sort of half FPS, half RTS sort of thing, and uh, made a couple maps for that in my spare time, and those got picked up as official maps um, and were very successful uh, in that mod, and um, you know, met a lot of people through that, and uh, kind of made a little bit of a uh, name for myself through those, at least you know, as far as making headway professionally, and so um, you know, then after that, I was able to get a job at Raven Software. So I, I entered the industry there, uh, working as a level designer on Quake Four. Uh, so that was my first ship game, and you know, continued working there for for a couple years. Worked on some of uh, the Wolfenstein game that came out in 2009. Worked on the the original prototype for Singularity uh, that that helped get that greenlit. Um, and then I came down to Texas, spent a couple years at Gearbox Software working on an early version of Borderlands. Uh, this was before they changed the, the art style and all that, which was, you know, they did a fantastic job with that uh, after the fact. Um, reunited with the Natural Selection guys for a little while working on Natural Selection 2, uh, for a little contract deal there. Helped them with an early teaser video and uh, some early level design stuff. and. Um, then it was after that that I, I found my way to Austin and, and Lightbox. It was right after they had, just a few months after they split out from Incognito and uh, had just moved down from Salt Lake City. I actually interviewed in Salt Lake City and in Austin. That was kind of a new experience. Um, and so I came down here in uh, the fall of 2009, uh, started working on Starhawk, ended up, uh, most of my responsibility on the game came down to the multiplayer levels. Uh, I did the the layout design for all 10 of the uh, competitive multiplayer maps that we shipped in the game. Uh, little bits and bobs here and, here and there. I uh, did some single player level design and mission scripting work as well. Um, and, uh, you know, carried that through the, through the project. And then once we wrapped up with that, uh, started moving on to DLC, I sort of shifted into the, the DLC design lead role. Uh, started doing a little bit more managing, but still kept you know, cranking out work. So I also did, we have seven new competitive maps um, that came out in 103 and 104 combined. And uh, so I did, you know, the layout designs for those and uh, then started working more with the other designers on, on their work on the modes and some of our other uh, things like prospector maps and all that. And that's how I got where I am today. When I was going over uh, some of the notes for this uh, interview and some of the research that I've been doing, it, it stuns me at the massive amount. And like I mentioned in the intro, uh, the game came out in May, and you guys you guys have already shipped a huge, huge amount of DLC to your fans. And each update just seems to be so uh, beefy, as it were. And as I mentioned in the intro, you guys are not messing around with this update either. Uh, I mean, we're talking about, uh, again, five new multiplayer maps, uh, three new game modes, new build and battle loadouts, things like that. And most of this stuff is free to anybody who plays Starhawk, uh, included in the uh, 104 update. A ton of other stuff available via the DLC as well. We'll get to all of this, but I guess let's start with the five new multiplayer maps. Tell us about the five new maps and uh, tell us a little bit about what players are going to experience uh, with these five new maps. You're absolutely right. This is a huge update. Um, and five new maps for free on um, 
so glad that we were able to do that. Um, you know, it's important, you know, we saw with, with Warhawk, or I should say they saw, and I wasn't here for that, but, uh, and you see this with so many other games too, when you start selling those map packs and gating it based on who's bought it and who hasn't, you just start getting this fractured community, and then every release after that is just a fracture of a fracture, and people are split up all over the place, and uh, it it just, it, it can hurt you in the long run to, to do that. So we really wanted to take the approach of, you know, don't put up these barriers to people playing the game. And and so there's where the, the free maps come in. So uh, in in this update, we've got, there's five new maps. Three of them are small maps. Um, these are uh, a good bit smaller than any of the maps in the game so far. They're made for smaller game sizes. Um, this is something that, you know, the community's wanted uh, for a long time, and we've wanted for a long time, too. We felt like there was kind of a kind of a gap at the, the lower end of uh, map size and player count. Um, and then in addition to those three maps, we also have uh, two new maps that are exclusive to Dogfight and our new Gatekeeper mode. These are Hawk-only maps. Um, they are tailored exclusively for flight. Uh, I hope the, the pilots out there uh, love these as much as you know, I, I love making them. Um, they, uh, you know, they're they're big, they're open, they've got a ton of flight pickups, and it's all about the dogfight space and uh, and those really intense, awesome air battles. So, uh, our three small maps we have. There's a new space map called Relay, uh, which is a small little space platform. Um, you know, to, to put it in perspective, it's maybe about a third the size of, or two thirds the size of uh, Orbital, which was previously the smallest map in our game. Um, we have a new Cypress map uh, called Glade. Uh, so we introduced the the Cypress environment back in 1.03, uh, which you know everybody seemed to really enjoy those maps. So we've brought that back for another go. Uh, two little islands and a dense cluster of trees and all that. Um, we have a new Ascency map called Junction, um, and this is a, a few separate islands. There's some broken bridges in between. You've got a big uh, structural centerpiece in the middle. It's high ground, um, and you know that that adds some really interesting gameplay. You got a jetpack up there, or, or fly up there to get there. Um, so I, I think. I think that map has some neat things you can do with it. And then our two dogfight maps. There's a, a space map called Flotilla and an acid sea map called Breaker. And Flotilla in particular, it's uh, in raw, you know, end-to-end -end size. I think now the largest map in the game. Um, it's great for a 32-player dogfight or gatekeeper run, and it's kind of that, that space shooter uh, fantasy. It's just asteroids and ships and dust clouds. A whole bunch of hawks trying to kill each other. So I, I think people are going to really enjoy that. You mentioned the size of the maps. You and I talked a little bit about this uh, the other night. We were talking about uh, developers, and they, they put out these the, these maps, and they talk about the size and things like that. And we kind of uh, riffed a little bit about how you guys manage uh, the size and why you know why size matters and, and how you manage the gameplay uh, on big and small maps. So, j just real quick, if you can explain to them what you were explaining to me about uh, uh, player density and things like that. Well, yeah, the the player density is really the key. I mean, if you know, you, you can advertise having the, the biggest maps on the face of the planet, but if a player drops in and they're the only person in you know a mile of, of terrain, is that really a good thing, you know, and um, I, I think it's something that, uh, you know, we, I, I think, you know, a little bit hit and miss in, in the original game, uh, you know, I pointed when we were talking before, I pointed to Fracture as being actually just physically overscaled, and, you know, it, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of really cool things to the layout, I think the, uh, you know, that big fractured rock look of our cover environment it's a really cool thing it was a lot of fun to work with um i think it makes you know one of the best uh flight spaces in the game for for dog fighting but you know driving from point a to point b and then getting there and then getting killed and going oh now i have to do that all again um you know it, it just got a little bit more spread out than, than what we want and and especially you know some people do prefer smaller games i i think i tend to myself um you know, the, the 32 player chaos is great, but there's people who want to be able to have a game just with their friends. You have the, the clan battles, you have a little bit more in the way of actual tactics and strategy when it's not just crazy explosions all over the place. And, um, 
And, and that again is where I think you know some of our some of our smaller maps before you know aren't even as small as they actually seem. Um, so getting these new small maps out there, I, th I think, was really important for for giving the, the players that are looking for that sort of thing uh, something to play on, something to have some fun with. And um, you know, now there's also nothing stopping you from dumping in you know 20 plus people into one of these tiny maps. And if you want to do that, go right ahead. It's going to be crazy explosions all over the place. Um, but you know, we just want to make sure we have that range. You know, I think we hit the the big range pretty well but you know you got to have that low range too for people who want to play it so to review the five new multiplayer maps uh are cypress glade space relay scourge junction scourge breaker and space flotilla let's move on to the three new game modes that are included in the 104 update yeah well, we've got you know like you said three new modes uh again absolutely free all players get these modes um you can jump into any game with them at any time um, we've got, uh, I mentioned before, there's the gatekeeper mode. Um, it's a hawk only, flight only mode. Um, and uh, then we've got our assault mode, which is a new uh, attack and defend mode. It takes a little bit of inspiration from zones, but makes it a more linear progression. You get a lot more defense uh, happening at, at uh, individual choke points along the way. And then the third mode is just straight up troop death and that's troop deathmatch mode and um you know that's something again that we had a, we saw a lot of demand from players um and then you know we we added that and then you know we had to add a little bit of a starhawk twist to it as well so you've got random buildings falling from the sky all over the place changing the battlefield on the fly um and it, it's just crazy insanity in that mode as far as assault goes it's a territory control mode right and the you're, you're split up as a an attacker and a defender is that the way it works that's right yeah you've got uh the attackers are going to spawn in out at the edge of the map and then the defenders have a chain of basins uh across the map that they're trying to defend um so this you know we've got then there's one point sometimes two when we split out the the connection uh, that the defenders have to hold against the attackers. So the attacker's goal is to capture and take down every one of these bases in the map before time runs out. Uh, so each base you take down, you get one point. At the end of the round, whether through time or uh, cap capturing them all, uh, you flip, flip sides run through it again, and then the team at the end with the high score wins. And, uh, of course, these are available on all the original maps uh, and uh, uh, Origin and Collider. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Gatekeeper will be, or Assault will be on, on all the original maps. And Gatekeeper is on all of the maps that support Dogfight. Um, not all the maps are going to support Dogfight, but the ones that do will support Gatekeeper. Um, and then Deathmatch is on... Um, it's on nine of our maps. Um, you know, we had to kind of find the, the right contained areas to, to hold the smaller things. So uh, all three of the new small maps will support that mode. And then there's six of our other maps that are going to support it as well. Again, we talked a little bit about this the other night, but uh, Gatekeeper seems to be, you, you described it as uh, Hawk Soccer, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, explain to everybody who hasn't had a chance to take a look at it yet. Explain to them how this uh, particular mode works. Well, Gatekeeper, uh, like I said, you know, it's a Hawk only mode. It's a team-based mode. So you have hawks on one side, hawks on the other side. Um, and in the middle, there's a ball. Uh, just a glowing, pulsing energy ball. And uh, one player from whichever team will get there, pick that up. And now your goal when you're carrying that ball is you want to rack up as many points as you can while you have it. And the way to do that are these gates that are scattered around the map. And each time you fly through a gate, you'll capture it for your team, uh, provided you fly through it with the ball. And each one of those gates is then worth one point. So you rack up these gates, and when you have a bunch of them, uh, you then have to score your points by flying through the goal in the middle of the map. Um, so the gates are these small kind of curved bracket things floating around the map, and then there's a big spinning ring in the middle of the map. So you fly out, rack up your points on the gates, and then make a beeline for the middle and try to score at that gate uh, before you get shot down. Now, if you get shot down, you drop the ball. Either team can pick it up. 
And you can also have both teams can control gates. So you can, you know, if, if your other if you, the other team has you know maybe five gates racked up and your team still has one from the last time you had the ball, you can really make people mad by shooting down their ball carrier and banking that one point and costing them five. <laughs> now it 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 kind of sound it kind of has uh, it seems like it's a variation of capture the flag. Is that a fair assessment? That was the, the original inspiration, yeah. We, we looked at, um, you know, just the, the basic capture the flag mode. And, uh, you know, you can do uh, fly with flag, uh, which is not quite the same thing. But we started with kind of that point where it's like, okay, here's a, here's a floating flag for each base that you can go out and grab. And then you start kind of evolving that, and it starts shifting into kind of the, the one flag CTF. And then the, the charging concept came in of, of you know, charging up your points and uh um it, it's uh it's an interesting beast but i think it's a lot of fun i think people are really going to like it especially the pilots out there in this might you might actually hang up on me when when i uh, say this but it, it even kind of has a uh, it kind of has a uh, quidditch feel to it would that be fair <laughs> you know i I think that is kind of fair. Um, you know, we don't have the, the golden snitch or anything, and probably would get the pants suit off us if we did. But um, I, I think when Dylan first announced it, actually, he used a little bit of a Quidditch comparison. I can, I can definitely see that as well. You know, I wouldn't say it was a direct inspiration, but uh, there's a lot of the same spirit there, just that that chaos and controlling the ball and, and all that. Well, it sounds like uh, fun. I, I still haven't got a chance to play it, but I'm dying to play it. Uh, you were talking about how the community really, there was a literally a, 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 a outcry from the community and they wanted a more uh, boots on the ground, infantry focused type of deathmatch uh, for the game and you guys gave them deathmatch arena. Now there's a couple of elements about this that i I, again, we were talking the other night, and you told me, you explained to me some of the uh, thought process that went into creating this mode, and uh, some of it was pretty. Uh, not only was it interesting, but it, it was actually pretty funny. Some of the uh, concepts that you were uh, throwing at me, but explain to everybody uh, the, the basic concept, which is pretty self-explanatory. But explain the concept of the falling uh, parts and things like that. Yeah, well, you know, we started with just straight up deathmatch, uh, which is. Um, you know what what people were saying they wanted you know they were able to play it in in warhawk and uh so we we started with that and and we felt like there was just something kind of missing from it um and that that's kind of a dangerous place because you don't want to start adding too much and then get away from the spirit of what people actually want out of it but um you know when when you have a game like starhawk you have this building battle mode that's such a, a core element of the game and it it felt weird to not have that present. So we started talking about ways that, that we could incorporate that into the mode, and, and that's kind of where the, the randomized falling buildings came into play. Um, you know, the, the actual pitch of this, uh, when, it, when it came up, um, I'm, I'm a little sad we weren't able to take it all the way here, um, but we, we were talking uh, a long time ago about, you know, what would a mode like this even look like? And the idea that came up is... The, the notion that uh, Cutter from the single player game, who is you know fictionally dropping all these parts in for our hero Emmett Graves and all that, has gone on a bit of a bender, uh, a space bender, if you will, and is drunk in orbit and just randomly firing down the contents of the arsenal onto the ground. And we had the the image of you know getting our our voice actor to do the uh, the drunken yelling and. <laughs> You know, snarky commentary, and um, yeah. At one point, I even wondered if it would be worth putting him on the scoreboard. So if he started getting building kills, he could actually be ranked with uh, with everybody else. Um, so you know, it, that kind of started to get into you know, it's still kind of a, a wacky, zany thing, but it started to bring it a little bit into the into the Starhawk world a little bit. So you know, sadly, by the time we actually came around to this mode, we weren't able to go back and do VO recording or any of that. But you know, I tell that story because I want people to kind of know the spirit of the mode. And I think I think that still comes through. You're running around, you're killing everything that moves, but at the same time, stuff is just falling all over the place. You've got bunkers falling, shields falling, sniper towers falling, jetpack defenses falling, um, pretty much anything that's not a vehicle pad. Um, although we do allow the the jet bikes, so you can kind of troll people by zipping around. Um, 
you know, these things are just falling randomly all over the battlefield. And, and that gets into kind of a little bit of what makes Starhawk Starhawk. The battlefield is now changing under your feet with little to no notice. Um, and you start getting this dynamic element that comes out of that. Now a bunker is dropped over here, you know there's weapons over there, there's shelter over there. Um, the energy shield I think is actually really interesting in this mode because it creates this protected bubble. You know, if somebody's chasing you, you have a chance to run in there and buy yourself a little time to regroup. Uh, or you can even have entire little battles that then get contained inside a shield. You know, if this thing comes down near a valuable pickup in the layout um, or, or something like that. So, um, you know, I, I hope when people play this that they that they get that, you know, just crazy free-for-all, kill-everything-that-moves thing that they wanted, but I hope they also are going to appreciate that extra layer, and I think it adds another layer of chaos. I mean, there was, you know, we were laughing a lot when we played this mode, <laughs> um, as I'm sure you can imagine, and, um, you know, it creates some, some really, really fun stuff kind of on the fly. It's going to be different every time you play it. The map layout with all the parts is going to be different every time you play it. And I think it turned out pretty well. I, I think I speak for all the Starhawk fans when I say, first of all, that's genius. Uh, Drunk Cutter would be an, a great name for a band now that I think about it. And for the record, in the future, if you need uh, any VO work on a Drunk Cutter type of thing, uh, just please, by all means, give me a call on, a, on Friday night, Saturday night, and and uh, maybe we can make that happen. Do you suddenly become Australian when drunk? <laughs> I look. I can work on it. All right. I can work all on right, my. All right. All right. I'll, I'll work on my Australian we'll, exit. We'll take that under advice. Deathmatch Arena. Uh, let's go go over the three game modes again: uh, Assault, Gatekeeper, Deathmatch Arena. And in addition to all of that stuff, as if that stuff isn't enough, uh, you guys also. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but also free to anybody who plays the game. They're going to get three new build and battle loadouts. Is that the way that's going to work? Yep, uh, we've got we've got a few new loadouts um, that uh, you know the the loadouts in in the main game uh, when we were putting those together, they they really came down a lot to what what the combination of vehicles was, and and you get kind of a personality out of that. You know, you strip the hawk out, you get ground pounder, you get that ground only battle, you get the the heavy tanks in there. Um, you know, we, we of course kept the, the classic loadout around for the people who played since the beta. Um, you know, we didn't have all the parts in then, but, you know, people knew how to play the game and uh, we didn't want to, you know, just take that away. Uh, you know, Heavyweight is just packed with almost everything that we can fit in there. Um, and so with these new loadouts, we wanted to still give that kind of, you know, we wanted to introduce a few new personalities to the game. Um, give you a few different ways to, to play it, ways that'll kind of change the strategies and all that. Um, so the first one we've got is called Trooper, um, and this one is uh, dedicated specifically for uh, troop to troop combat. Um, it is uh, it's the default loadout on the three new small maps, um, which are not the best maps for big vehicle battles. We do allow some of the vehicles on there in other loadouts. We want you to have that freedom. Um, but Trooper kind of pairs it down to the small map. Um, you know, there's not a lot of extended mobility options from the other vehicles, and it's really just focusing on what can you do up to each other on the ground. We do have the jetpack in there for a little bit of variety. We do have our two new parts, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, then we have the lightweight loadout, which is sort of a natural counter to heavyweight. We had looked at, you know, th this name has been floating around since before we shipped, but it was kind of like, well, you know, we didn't really feel confident with, with that loadout at the time, so we, um, and we didn't want to add too much all at once. Um, you know, you, you don't want people to have too much to choose from and, you know, have too many game varieties and all that. So we kind of just let that idea simmer for a while, and, um, but it was something, you know, people requested this loadout by name, essentially. Um, now, I don't know if this is the exact combination they were thinking of, um, but it's going to be a ground-only loadout, uh, so there's no Hawk in it and there's no tank. Uh, so that takes the two real big heavy hitters and pulls them out of the game. Um, so, you know, your main traversal now is going to be, you're going to have the, the Sidewinder jet bike, you're going to have the Jeep, uh, the Razorback, um, and you're going to have the jetpack dispenser. Um, in addition, this will also include both the new parts uh, that I'll be talking about with the, the DLC in just a little bit. Um, and the final one is the, the speeder loadout. And this thing is, you know, it's made to be fast. Uh, it's our, 
are fast with vehicles. Um, there's no tank, there's no jetpack, but you do get the Hawk, you get the Razorback, you get the Sidewinder, Sidewinder, and you do get our new DLC vehicle in there as well. Um, do not have the energy shield in there. It's not really built for kind of turtling and defense quite as much. It's about, you know, just speed and chaos. Um, you know, it can be uh, kind of a crazy loadout in, uh, in CTF. It's definitely well suited for zones, especially on a bigger map when you're crossing a lot of distance. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think each of those, they're, they're only subtle differences when you swap out a vehicle here and there. Um, but I, I think they're going to just give people a few new ways to play the game, and I hope everybody likes them. Again, I, I, I just can't believe that they're getting all of this stuff for free, and then they're, the, you... you it, <laughs> When you guys do this, when when the game came out of the box, and and this is, I guess this is a, something that I've always wondered about. Now, I'm sure that there are times when you guys kind of, I'm sure you have meetings or a whiteboard or something where you kind of plan all this out and you say, okay, we're going to do this, but three months down the road, we're going to uh, give them this, or six months down the road, we're going to give them this. But when you create the game, I, I guess it's kind of like the chicken and egg uh, uh, type of thing. What comes first? Do, do you do you create the game and then you wake up one day and go, hey, let's uh, let's change their loadouts or let's give them more variety with their loadouts and stuff or is this stuff that that you guys were talking about a year and a half ago and you knew what you were going to have to do to enhance the game as it as it uh, went through its cycle um i mean it it can be a little bit of both um you know i mentioned you know the deathmatch mode we talked about a long time ago you know that was something that you know we did talk about off and on but you know we ended up saying all right well you know, we think for the shipping game that the better combination is shipping with dogfight mode, which is a deathmatch mode, um, but you know, not the not the ground one. And some of the work that we did in that mode was a little bit of a framework that we knew. You know, we built it in such a way that we knew we could come back to it and use that as a foundation uh, if and when we wanted to do something else. So that happens a little bit. You know, like I mentioned with the the loadouts. You know, like the the lightweight idea had been kind of floating around, but we didn't feel like we had the, the right combination of parts for it. And again, we wanted to keep a, a simpler set of loadouts for people to learn and, and get used to in the game. And, you know, the nice thing about the loadouts is they're, they're very easy to put together. Um, and they're very easy. I mean, we could, you know, hotfix more in the future possibly if, if that's something that we see a lot of demand for. Um, you know, we still want to be careful that we don't do too many or, you know, do too many crazy things with them. But, um, you know, most of the stuff though that that you're seeing, um, you know, it, it's uh, when when you're making the game. I mean, you're you're making the game, and you really don't have time for anything else. You know, like some of these maps. You know, I had in the back of my head this little glimmer of, wow, if we had time, I would love to make this map. Like that's actually how Flotilla came around. Because um, I, you know, I grew up a big fan of the, the space dogfight sims and all that, and I was. Like man, it would be really, really awesome to just have a you know just a dogfight map set in an asteroid field, and that just wasn't something that fit anywhere. While we're trying to make the core game and, and get it balanced and get it polished and fix bugs and all that, uh, but that was something you know that map actually you know we we finished the game and I was sitting around one morning, got in early, nobody else was in yet, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna give this a shot, and I started making it and. Um, it turned out well enough that we were able to include it then as, as this free update now here. Um, you know, there were... Um, uh, the same thing happened with, uh, with Relay as well. You know, it's an idea kind of percolating there for a while, but we didn't really have a chance to do anything about it. But when it came time to, oh, now we're going to add some new maps, then it was like, okay, well, I know I want one map to be this. This is something that it's pretty well developed uh, as a plan. So I could just start making that one right away and then take the time to kind of start figuring out what the other ones would be and, and all of that. But, I mean, we, you know, as soon as the game shipped, we started cranking on, you know, what, what now are these new things? We knew we were going to offer new things, but we didn't really know what they were at that point. We didn't have time to really think that far ahead. Um, so that was, you know, we all came back together and started laying out all these ideas on the table. That was the same time that the, the Cypress environment uh, came up and, and was concepted in there. Um, and I mean, this is what, I mean, it, pretty much from the end of Starhawk until 
you know, now. I mean, that's that's what we've been doing, is getting all this stuff put together and keeping pretty busy with it. So I do want to remind everybody that we do have some community questions. We took the time to uh, listen to the Starhawk community, uh, taking a cue from Lightbox Interactive. So we are going to, if Mr. Weldon will uh, accommodate us, we are going to ask some questions uh, from the community. That's coming up. Uh, but again, let's uh, let's go ahead and continue then. You keep teasing about this uh, this this vehicle. You keep teasing about the other DLC. So go ahead, if you, if you can, lay out uh, most of the DLC that we're going to see and, and tell us all about this new vehicle. Well, yeah, we've got, you know, in addition to, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had all the, all this, free content out there for people to check out, change the game up, give people a reason to come back to it, try it out for the first time. But in addition to that, we do have some downloadable content that'll be, I, as of when I walked into this room, it was not yet available. You know, as far as I know, it should be sometime today, just waiting for the, you know, the PlayStation Store to, to do its scheduled update. Hopefully by the time this thing is out there and you're listening to it, you've already got the option to get all this. Um, but we have we have a lot of stuff out there. Um, I mean, first things first. You know, if you missed the limited edition uh, that we did at launch, that content's available now. There's a couple player customizations in there. Um, we've got there's a, a a prospector map in there as well. Um, Maw's despair. Um, so those are those are going to be unlocked for everybody now. I think a couple of the other uh, early exclusive player skins are going to be available. Um, and then in addition to that, we've added a lot of new content uh, for people to check out. Um, there's a lot of customizations. We've got uh, multiple uh, character customizations. And again, these come in, in parts. You can swap out you know, different parts and actually mix and match, find what you want. Uh, we've got new paint jobs uh, for all the vehicles. Um, my favorite one in that sense, the I don't remember the exact name we're calling it, but it's kind of a like a World War II uh, theme type look. It's got the uh, those classic paint jobs and uh, kind of riveted metal look going for it. Really, really cool look. Uh, and then what the one that I think I'm really the most excited about is we have another new prospector map uh, coming out in this update. And uh, this map is called the Mire, and it's set on Cyprus, so it's another swamp-themed map. And you know, traditionally, the prospector mode, if you've played it, is uh, you have one rift extractor, you and up to three other buddies uh, can drop in, and you try to defend it against six waves of enemies. Um, and we we've kind of taken this map to eleven, if you will. Um, there are now three rifts that you have to defend simultaneously. There are eight waves, including kind of a mini boss wave and a much, much tougher final wave. Um, and this thing, it is, it is intense and it it's crazy. Uh, it's a bigger challenge than some of our other prospector maps to date. Um, you know, we kind of wanted to lay down a little bit of a gauntlet for those of you that are playing co op. Uh, and we just, we had a blast uh, playing this thing. Um, and I, I think if you like Prospector, I think this is our best Prospector map to date. I think you owe it to yourself to check it out, uh, you know, play with some friends. And, you know, we've also made it easier for you to play Prospector now. This is part of the free patch update. Um, you know, games will show up in the game list now. You can browse those. Um, and uh, we, we've made a few adjustments as well to the... The enemy balancing, uh, when you have multiple players, made that a little bit more forgiving. You get better XP payouts now as well. So it's a really, really great chance to jump into Prospector mode and check it out. Um, I I can't say, again, how, how excited I am for, for the Meyer to come out and for people to check it out. Kudos to you, sir, on the uh, uh, Spinal Tap reference. I just wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> you know, you, you got to use that now and then. So the, the other two bits of DLC that we've got are... Uh, these are going to come up in the multiplayer game. We've got one new build and battle part and one new vehicle. Uh, the new build and battle part is the pod cannon. Um, it is, you know, if you think of it fictionally, it's sort of uh, uh, like an emergency escape pod for a work site. Um, it functions a lot like a turret. Uh, you hop into it, you aim, you get an artillery type trajectory, the same way you do in the uh, the alternate weapon on the tank. Uh, when you hit fire. You come launch it out of this thing in a drop pod, you follow that arc, and you land halfway across the map. Maybe not halfway across the map, uh, depends on the size of the map, but uh, it is a great, uh, 
you know, fast escape option from a base. Um, it's a great attacking option for a base. It gets pretty crazy when you start seeing these things arcing in from the distance. You know, it's like artillery, except there's dudes popping out trying to kill you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that that's turned out uh, pretty fun. I saw, you know, I was watching the, the Urgent Fury uh, video from, like, the five hours or whatever ridiculous, amazing length of uh, gameplay and you know the first time that Shane hopped in that you know just kind of giggling with glee as he went firing off halfway across the map <laughs> so I, I think that's one that, that people are going to have some fun with and then the other one is a new vehicle it's called the Grizzly Rig um, and this is uh, you know sort of uh, sort of a powered armor type suit it uh, comes in a little bit in between the size of a regular guy on the ground and the size of a hawk um, or the hawk in mech form rather and uh, it's, a, it's a fast vehicle. It's got a sprint capability. It's going to work just like when you're running around on foot. Um, and it is a pretty beefy little guy. Um, he's got uh, three different ways to attack. The main one is, I believe in the video, we called it the Goth Cannon. Uh, it's just kind of a, a blaster, nice little explosion at the end wherever it hits. Um, and that weapon is especially effective against vehicles. Um, it's a great counter against that guy on the jet bike getting out of your base with the flag. Um, if you're good with your aim, it'll actually track and take down Hawks pretty well. Um, and you're, it makes for a really good mobile counter to uh, any of the other vehicles, too, to raise or back the tank. Um, so that, that's a, a beefy weapon you've got. Um, you also have there's a melee attack. You have basically a jackhammer uh, for an arm. Um, so when you're just standing, hit melee, you'll do a little ground smash with a little area of effect around it. You can also do uh, you know, a, a weeping air attack smash, which will do a little bit more damage. And that damage can actually scale up if you do it from high enough in the air. Um, and then you also get uh, sort of a, an interference weapon, the EMP. Uh, you can charge that up pretty quickly, fire it off, uh, it'll disable uh, vehicle weapons, it'll disable structures. Um, you can just kind of shut everything around you down for a brief period of time, and that's a really great disruptive tool uh, you know, to break into you know, a really fortified base or you know, try to you know, shut somebody down uh, outside your base. And uh, the one downside to all that power is you're still not that big, you're still kind of weak. Um, you are exposed just like in the Hawk, you can get sniped out of it and somebody can just hop in and run off with your Grizzly. Um, you're also going to be a little bit more exposed to the troop weapons than you would be in a Hawk. You know, you see this guy jumping up into the air about to do a ground smash on you, drop a grenade at his feet and you're going you're gonna to do some damage. Um, so, you know, you, you get a lot of that power, but you've got a bit of a trade-off. You, you know, if you just go charging in all the time, even kinetic rifles in, in a group can take you down real fast. So you've got to kind of, you know, weigh your options um, and, and think about that going in. But it's a fast vehicle. It's an aggressive vehicle. Um, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think it adds a lot to the game. Um, it's going to show up in the... Uh, you know, the trooper loadout, for example. Um, we actually also, to make the heavyweight loadout fit its name a little bit better, we've swapped the jet bike for the Grizzly in that loadout, so you'll be able to get it in with the, the tanks and the Hawks and all that uh, in that loadout as well. And it, it's a lot of fun, and I, I hope people enjoy it. But yeah, so that, that's the Grizzly. Uh, both of those things are going to be available. Um, I think they're going to be $4.99 on the PlayStation Store. And the other thing that's really important about this, in the same way with the maps, you know, we, we want to make sure this is a seamless experience for players. Um, and to do that, you know, we don't want to just gate people out uh, from this content. So if anybody on your team has built a pod watcher or drops in a grizzly, you can use it. If you snipe an enemy out of his grizzly, you can hop in and you can use it. We don't lock use of these things uh, based on whether or not you've purchased it. Uh, and you know, it's a little bit a little bit different approach to the DLC. I, I hope people will appreciate what we're doing with it. Um, you know, we, we want to find that balance of you know making sure the business side works while also making sure we're not screwing over the people playing the game in the process. And, and hopefully, this is kind of that balance. 
Well, as I mentioned, I mean, it, I, I can't even believe the massive amount of stuff that you guys have done just in this one update. And I mean, I'm talking about since the release, even uh, you guys have just, uh, you, well, you've catered to your fan base. And again, I wish more developers put that kind of thought into taking care of their uh, fans. And by the way, uh, also included in the uh, the update, correct me if I'm wrong here, Andrew, but uh, you guys have even got a button that will lead you right to the PlayStation Store so you can see all of the downloadable content. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, uh, you know, we added some of that into the interface in game. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, the, the content people is there for them to get if they want to get it. So hopefully that'll be easy for people to find, easy to navigate. You know, if you are in the build battle menu, you decide, oh, I actually want to grab a Greenly. You can just, you know, select it from that menu, and it'll bring up that option from there. Listen, I, I want to get you back to work. Uh, I don't want Dylan to get mad at me or anything, but uh, as I mentioned, I have a few uh, community questions here, and it, it, it has just started. Uh, we've got some thunderstorms in the area. I don't know if you can hear that right there, but uh, that is live thunderstorms, ladies and gentlemen. I'll go to the color radar here in just a second, but uh, <laughs> uh, if you've got a few minutes, if you would, i got a couple of questions from the community. I, I won't keep you long. I think we got some pretty good questions here, so I, I just want to to throw a couple at you here. Um, let's see. You and I were talking about uh, Gremlin Clown the other night. The first question, I'll take it from him. Let's see. First of all, he says, uh, Andrew Weldon, a.k.a. Kung Fu Squirrel, will LBI be coming out with an art book or maybe do a blog on one uh, featuring never-before-seen production artwork and so on? That is, that's an interesting question because I am kind of a graphic artist and I love the style and the design and, and all of that that goes with Starhawk the colors and, and everything. Some amazing art in this game, right? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we had both internally, you know, our concept artists here and uh, some guys that we contracted externally, uh, I think just did some fantastic work. And, you know, it, it's always, I, you know, you may have seen and some of the people listening may have seen um, shots of our giant whiteboard with concept art just plastered all over it. And there's a lot of that that hasn't even been released, hasn't, you know, hasn't seen the light of day that, that's really, really incredible. Um, I'm a sucker for art books myself. I would absolutely love a Starhawk art book. We don't have a plan for that right now, um, but I think the idea of a blog post or something like that is fantastic. I think it'd be great to combine some of the, you know, the, the years of, of work that we have on that and, and tell a little bit of that story and all that. So. You know, I, I can't promise that, but um, I think it's something worth looking into. Let's go now to... See, I just had a... Oh, Aaron Rift is this guy's name and I don't know if that's his real last name but if it is that's pretty cool um, he says uh, hey Andrew really looking forward to the new patch uh, do you have any idea whether Starhawk may be receiving even more goodies in the future or is LBI pretty much moving on after uh, this uh, upcoming patch and I guess he's referring to uh, 104 how about it are, are you guys uh, are you guys done as far as uh, content or can fans possibly be looking for something in the future from uh, Lightbox well you know a lot of that's really going to be up to Sony at this point, um, and I, I think the, you know, we have no shortage of ideas and, and things that we'd like to do. There are, you know, things that you know we think can be improved, things that we can add in, um, and that, that's true really of any game. You get done with it, and it's like, oh man, I still have all these ideas left. Uh, and, you know, so I mean, it, it's really just going to be, you know, what, what Sony wants to do, what, what they think will, you know, be in the best position to do. Uh, the best thing that you can do if you want more Starhawk, if uh, you, know, you know you love it, and, uh, want there to be more, is you know get out there, you know let people know about the game. You know we've got the the PSN versions going live now, uh, and uh, you know there's you know it's a great chance to jump into the game if you didn't before. It's a great chance to come back to it. You know, you can grab some of the new content and all that, because uh, that's really what's going to determine it. If there's a, a real appetite out there, then you know maybe maybe Sony will decide in the future, like, okay, yeah, we want to do some more of that. But uh, you know, it, it's really going to hinge on on them and uh, what they want us to be doing at this point. 
Just like we've talked about uh, on and off in the in in our pre-interview and everything else, you know, the Warhawk fans became the Starhawk fans, and just like you said, it, they can perpetuate it. So uh, get out there, tell your friends and neighbors all about Starhawk if you haven't yet. And uh, I think that's really exciting that they can actually just download the game via PlayStation Network now. I think it's going to make it easier for everybody to play Starhawk, and I can't wait to see a bunch of new faces out there on the battlefield. Uh, one more question, Andrew, and I will let you uh, go for the day. Ace the Cat says, I don't know if this is a question or a comment or both, probably a little bit of both, uh, is the Sidewinder's lack of uh, rudimentary offensive ability a conscious design choice, or was it simply not considered worth it to allow Sidewinders to be able to chase and take out other Sidewinders? Will the Sidewinders receive any kind of upgrades in the future with DLC, or even the ability to shoot the KR while in motion? Thanks for taking the time to answer questions. That is a bit of a deliberate design. Um, you know, the, the jet bike is you know, really the oldest vehicle in the game, I think. It's, uh, it, it was there, you know, in rough form when I started here, you know, three years ago, and uh, it's been through a lot of updates and iterations, and, you know, we had a couple versions that had a little bit of weapons capacity, and, um, you know, really where we settled in, in both thematically and from gameplay is kind of the the, the horse metaphor, you know, this is your, your horse is going to get you from point A to point B, uh, it's not really an offensive weapon, and it's got so much speed and maneuverability that, you know, letting you, you know, wreck people while you're zipping around like <laughs> that uh, could be a little bit problematic. Um, there are things that, that we could, you know, potentially look at, uh, tweaking a little bit here and there, but the the general function is what we wanted out of it. It's get you from point A to point B really fast, but it's dangerous to do that. It's even more dangerous in the new patch uh, because you can be locked onto by rockets, um, which is to help uh, adjust for some of the, the CTF changes. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those one of those risk-reward balances. And, of course, you and I talked about this. It's interesting that you said that it's, it was kind of like your your horse analog. We were talking about the design of the game and things like that and how uh, how much influence the American Old West had uh, on the game. And I think I asked you this the other night, trying to explain to, to the folks listening, and then I'll let you go. You know, w- with the influence of the American Old West, uh, as far as the fiction goes and stuff like that, do you take the functionality and make it fit into the fiction, or is it the other way around, or, or how does that work when you're putting this stuff together? You know, like the question is, why can't I kill people with my horse? When you started out, and you guys started designing the bike, you you were literally saying, okay, this is just a mode of transportation. It's not necessarily a combat weapon. Yeah, in, in that case, you know, at, at that point, the style of the game was actually very different. And that's something where, you know, if, for example, we, we are able to go back and show some of that concept art, I think that's something that, that would really show. So really, that was just, here's a really fast vehicle, you know, um, I can't speak for the, the initial thought behind it again because they, they had that kind of in when I got here, but you know, it's probably something like, hey, let's make a really awesome hovering motorcycle and kind of go from there. And so that was something where we, we were able to sort of retrofit that horse mentality onto it uh, once we kind of settled in on that Western vibe and all that. And you know, that kind of that kind of varies from case to case. I mean, what you really want is you want the, the game mechanics and structure and all that to function, hopefully independent of theme, uh, but then you need to make sure that it also integrates into it. You know, I can speak from you know a level design perspective, which is most of what I what I did on the game. And you know, in, in multiplayer especially, you're really, really just worried about those uh, you know, those flow lines, the routes, the the structures, the spacing and you know, a lot of the theme is kind of just you know, dressing on top of that. But in, you know, for example, the the single player levels, uh, especially the levels on, on Dust, you know, when you get to the, the defense of White Sands late in the game, you know, that, that level layout was really informed by a lot of the the Western influence, you know, just that, that dusty town main street uh, with the buildings lined up, the big saloon, the sheriff's office, you know, those elements all are there because that was the style and theme of our game. So it really comes down to just kind of knowing the appropriate application of, of both. You know, you don't want to necessarily 
force something in mechanically just because it's in theme, but you also don't want to just force mechanics or layouts or structures on your game that suddenly don't fit or anything like that. By the time you guys hear this, all of this incredible content will be available, so you guys pick all this stuff up, enjoy it at will, and uh, Andrew, what's going to happen in Lincoln when the Wolverines show up? Got a score, uh, you got a score for me? You're not going to be happy. I, <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Okay, well, we will talk. I, I think it's what, what, the last part of November, something like that? Uh, it's the, the end of October, yeah. In, end of October. Uh, we will... Uh, just, just know that I'm, I'm going to be there, and it's not going to be... I'm going to be very happy, and you're going to be very not happy. We will <laughs> we will reconvene at some point uh, on this matter, sir, but all right, uh, all right. thank you for uh, taking the time again. Thanks to uh, Dylan and everybody there that uh, made this possible, and thank you for laying it out uh, so specifically and uh, taking the time to do that and answer the questions and everything. So thanks for being here. Uh, take care of you, and uh, take care of everybody out there in Austin, and uh, take care of Shane if you can. Buy the guy a burger or something next time he comes. To, I think he's coming to Austin in a couple of weeks, so uh, buy him a burger and tell him it's from me or something. All right, I'll keep an eye out. Okay, Andrew Weldon, Senior Designer at Lightbox Interactive. Thank you, sir, for uh, hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. And that just about does it for this episode of Urgent Frequency. Please send your questions, comments, or suggestions to Commander Fury at UrgentFury.com. Network with us via Twitter, on Facebook, the official Urgent Fury blog, Urgent Fury Unleashed and via Urgent Fury Live on our Twitch TV channel. Urgent Frequency is produced by Urgent Fury Holdings, LLC, and right here in the studio by Wendy Ringwald, with a very special thanks to Dylan Job, Harvard Bonin, and the entire staff at Lightbox Interactive. Be sure to join us next time, kids, as we celebrate our 100th episode. Until then, I remain Commander Claymore Fury. Keep your feet wet and your powder dry. Hoo-yah!